In this set of boards, I'll tell you something about Clifford algebras. So one way to think about Clifford algebras is as a kind of a quantization or deformation of the exterior algebra. Throughout this set of boards, K will be a Q algebra. Really, I just need two to be invertible in K. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you need to set things up a little bit differently because symmetric bilinear forms and quadratic forms are not quite the same thing. So when a polynomial f over k is a quadratic form, that is to say, it's homogeneous of degree 2. It's a linear combination of monomials of degree 2. Well, recall on the first set of boards, I explained how we associate to any defining equation of a hypersurface singularity, for example, a quadratic form, a special category, the homotopy category of matrix factorizations. In the case of quadratic forms, that theory is particularly simple. So the theory of matrix factorizations, henceforth MFs, equals, in some sense, I won't precisely explain, the representation theory of a certain associative algebra, the Clifford algebra. Of a symmetric bilinear form, associated to f, or what's the same, a symmetric matrix. So the Clifford algebra of the Hessian of f at the origin, which is just all the second order partial derivatives of f evaluated at the origin. So that's an n by n matrix. To such a matrix you can associate an algebra, the Clifford algebra, as I'll explain in a moment, And representations or modules over that algebra are in some sense the same thing as matrix factorizations of f. So you can view the theory of matrix factorizations as a kind of far-reaching generalization of Clifford algebras of quadratic forms. So to just to take a simple example, if f is the following quadratic form, which is the sum of positive squares minus another sum of squares, then up to factors of 2, the Hessian just has a bunch of 1s and then a bunch of minus 1s. Where r plus s is equal to n. Okay, so in the next board I'll explain how to define this algebra. So here's the theorem. Let V be a finite rank free K module equipped with a symmetric bilinear form B. So recall that just means a function which is linear separately in each variable and such that b of v comma w is equal to b of w comma v for all w and v. Then I can consider pairs c mu where c is a k-algebra now recall from the second group of boards that our convention here is that while k is commutative, algebras over k need not be. In particular, I don't mean that c is commutative. So among all pairs consisting of a possibly non-commutative k-algebra c and a k-linear map mu from v to c, 
Okay, so we consider pairs of such data satisfying the following condition. That when you take mu of V times mu of W plus mu of, mu of W plus mu of V, and this expression here is sometimes referred to as the anti-commutator of those two elements of the algebra. The condition is that this be equal to a scalar B of V W acting on the identity of C. So C is a K algebra, so it's a K module. In particular, I can act on the identity with any scalar, in this case, B. So I can consider all such pairs, and the claim is that among all those pairs, there's a universal one. Which is denoted CVB mu. Since it's the universal one, it's unique up to canonical isomorphism, and we call it the Clifford algebra. Of the pair VB. So maybe I'll briefly say what this universal business is about. Uh, it simply means, I'll maybe not go into the details, but it means that given any such data, so a map, mu, satisfying those conditions, uh, maybe let's give it a different letter, let's say phi. So phi satisfying this condition here, the universality of the Clifford algebra, which is this pair, says that that map factors uniquely, so there exists a unique uh, capital phi, which is a morphism of algebras making that diagram commute. So that's what the universal property of the Clifford algebra is. And it's easy to construct such a thing if you're used to this kind of thing. The Clifford algebra is just the tensor, tensor algebra of V, that's the universal algebra of a K admitting a linear map from V of any kind, modulo the following two-sided ideal. So this, this condition is for all V, W, and V, obviously. Okay, so this means the two-sided ideal generated by those expressions as V and W range over all elements of V. And then you can check that the canonical map from V to the tensor algebra and then to that quotient works. Okay, so one remark I want to make about that is that if you look at that two-sided ideal, while the generators are not homogeneous, these elements here have degree 2, and this element here has degree 0 in the tensor algebra, still they're both of even degree. So that means that the quotient has a canonical Z2 grading. That is, I can write this quotient as a sum of things of even degree and things of odd degree. So even, odd. I can't tell the difference between 1 and 3 because this relation might mix up those degrees, but I can tell what's odd and what's even. So such a, an algebra that has a decomposition like that, such that multiplying two even things gives you an even thing, multiplying two odd things gives you an even thing, an odd and an even thing multiplied give you an odd thing. Uh, such a decomposition of an algebra is called a Z2 graded algebra. So the Clifford algebra is a Z2 graded algebra over K. So some remarks about this algebra. First of all, observe that if I square an element, or I suppose 
I should write mu. Uh, we often elide this map, right? So we elide the mu from V to the Clifford algebra. Partly we're doing, uh, we're identifying this universal thing with that particular construction and just thinking about V as an element of the tensor algebra and then taking its uh, residue class. So we elide that map and just think about elements of the vector space, uh, the free module V, as being elements of the Clifford algebra. Uh, but let me write it, I guess, for the moment. If I take mu V squared, then by the identity that defines the Clifford algebra, that's going to be BVV. Uh, and if B happens to be an inner product, that is, it has the positivity property of an inner product, that's, of course, just the norm of V squared. So you square an element of V, thought of as an element of the Clifford algebra, and you get just the scalar, which is its norm squared. So that's one way of understanding what is happening when you form the Clifford algebra. Now, the simplest example of a Clifford algebra is where you just take that pairing B to be zero. So, of course, you can keep in mind the possibility that K is a field, right? You could take K to be R or C. Now, if I take B to be zero, that's the sort of opposite of it being an inner product, I guess, then the relations say that any elements of any pair of vectors in V thought of as elements of the Clifford algebra anti-commute. And that's simply, as you can easily check, the exterior algebra. So the Clifford algebra generalizes the exterior algebra. The second example is the one we're ultimately interested in. If f is a quadratic form, so f belongs to the polynomial ring, I can take the tangent space at the origin, call that v. That's a free k, a free module over the polynomial ring of uh, rank n. But I'm just going to take the part generated by scalars times the derivatives. So just think about this as being um, just a formal symbol, if you like. And the pairing on that just evaluates those two differential operators on F and evaluates at the origin. So that's certainly a bilinear form. For example, if I take k to be r, um, and I take n to be 1, and I just call x, uh, call x1 x, and take e to be the basis vector of v, which is free of rank 1. Well, okay, so I guess I want some notation for the Clifford algebra. We're going to use this later. So the Clifford algebra of f is going to mean the Clifford algebra of that free module v with that particular pairing associated to f. Okay, so in the case where I take k to be r, n to be 1, I name this thing e, and I take f to be just minus x squared. So what's the Clifford algebra? Well, it's the tensor algebra. That's just the symmetric algebra because there's only one generator. So that's just the polynomial ring in E. And what I'm dividing by is just the relation that E squared is equal to, well, this thing paired with itself. And given the formula here for F, you can see that's minus one. So E squares to minus one. Okay, so that's just the polynomial ring modulo that relation. That's, of course, uh, since k is r, that's just the algebra c. Okay, so the point of that example is to show you that, well, if you put in minus squares into the quadratic form, 
the effect of the Clifford algebra is to introduce formal square roots of minus 1. If you put positive squares in f, then you're introducing formal roots of 1. So maybe I'll add an exercise here. And the exercise is what happens if B is not symmetric? I mean, I can obviously take the tensor algebra and mod out by those same relations, even if B is not symmetric. Uh, why is that not an interesting generalization? That's the exercise. So what's that got to do with matrix factorizations? I promised there was a way of constructing matrix factorizations from modules over the Clifford algebra. So let's get on with that. So let f be as above a quadratic form. V a finite rank free Z2 graded CF module. CF was the Clifford algebra I introduced on the previous board derived from the Hessian of F. So that means that there's a morphism of Z2 graded algebras from CF to the ring of endomorphisms k linear of v uh, maybe just to spell out what the z2 grading on this thing looks like so remember v well maybe not remember so to say that v is z2 graded is to say that it comes with a decomposition into an even and an odd part and if i take that as a matrix decomposition then a k-linear map from V to V, which has non-zero entries on the diagonal only, is called even. And if it has non-zero entries on the off-diagonal, that's called odd. Since any k-linear map from V to itself can be written as a sum uniquely of such even and odd k-linear maps, that means that this k-module is a Z2-graded algebra. And to say that it's a Z2-graded module over CF means that rho, which uh, gives the action, is of degree 0 as a morphism of K algebras with a Z2 grading. Okay, so we write rho for the action of CF. Uh, the claim is the pair consisting of V tensored with the polynomial ring and the operator on that finite rank free Z2 graded module over the polynomial ring given by this sum is a matrix factorization. of f. Right, so this row of this element of uh, the free module underlying the Clifford algebra, that acts on v, and this just means act by multiplication by xi. So that's how that operated um, del is to be read. Okay, so here's the proof. It's just the calculation. So if I square that, I get a sum over ij of xi rho ddxi xj rho ddxj. That's a sum over ij So the multiplication by a polynomial commutes with the action of this row operator. 
Now I can divide that sum into the repeated indices where I get a term like this. And then I get, uh, there's two ways of ending up with x i x j, right? In either order, I could have i j or j i if they're distinct indices. So I get the following. Okay, but that's sum over i x i squared. By definition of the Clifford algebra, this thing here is a half d squared f dx i squared evaluated at the origin. And this term in brackets over there is just the second order partial derivative, again evaluated at the origin. And if you take a quadratic form and just have a look at it, that is, write it as a sum like this, and then just evaluate what these derivatives are. They just pick up these coefficients. So it's easy to see that this is just f as claimed. So the interesting thing is that essentially every matrix factorization of a quadratic form arises in exactly this way from a module over the associated Clifford algebra. I'm not going to state that precisely or prove it in this set of boards, but what I want to do now is look at a particularly interesting example. So I'm going to take f to be the quadratic form that I introduced earlier, a difference of a sum of squares. I'll use slightly different notation. I'm going to introduce y variables, y1 through yn, and x variables, xi, x1 through xn. And then v, the tangent space at the origin, is spanned by the ddyi's and the ddxi's. And the bilinear form Has the following definition. There are no cross terms. Um, if I do yi and yj, I just get delta ij. So remember there was a factor of a half in here, right? So by definition, uh, b was given by a half d squared f dyi dyj evaluated at the origin. So that just gives me delta ij. Similarly for the x's, except now I get a minus sign. So that's going to introduce square roots of minus 1 corresponding to every index i. And I guess that's all I need to say. So hence, CF, which was the Clifford algebra of V and this pairing B, is generated. Well, just to save myself writing so much, I'm going to write nu for DDYI and omega for DDX I viewed as generators of the Clifford algebra. And those are subject to the relations implicit in the formulas above for the pairing, namely, namely the omegas anti-commute, except if i is equal to j. Oh, excuse me. It's a factor of 2 there. And a minus sign. The news anti-commute except if j is equal to i, in which case they give you 2, and the omegas commute, anti-commute rather, with the news. Uh, in particular, notice that, uh, as I said, omegas, the omegas give square roots of minus 1 in this algebra, and the news square to 1. Okay, so next we're going to consider a particular 
module over this Clifford algebra, CF, and see what the associated matrix factorization of F is. And this actually is a foundational construction in the theory of Landau-Ginzburg models and also in the application to geometry of interaction. Consider the following CF module. Z2 graded, of course. So, as a free K module, it's just the exterior algebra on the following K module of rank N. The Z2 grading is determined by giving the theta's degree 1. So maybe I'll call this thing uh, V. So that is to say V0, the even part of that Z2 graded free K module is given by, um, since the theta i's have degree one modulo two, the even part will have an even number of thetas. That is, it's the even powers of the exterior algebra. And the odd part of V is the odd powers. So, for example, wedge 3 of that thing. So I have to tell you how the generators of CF act on that Z2 graded free K module of rank 2 to the N, and they act by the following formulas. So the generator nu, which is associated to ddy, acts by theta i plus theta i star. Here, according to the notational convention I've introduced earlier, uh, theta i and theta i star are the operators on the exterior algebra, which are given by wedging and contracting with theta i and theta i star, respectively. So, um, those are operators, k-linear operators on the exterior algebra of odd degree with respect to the Z2 grading. So that's how nu i acts and omega i acts by theta i minus theta i star. All right, so lemma, this defines SCF module. So I just need to check that the generators, uh, when acting by this definition, satisfy the relations that I wrote down on the previous board. So I'll do two of them and leave the other one to you. So proof. So let's check the following. Let's compute what rho omega i, rho omega j, plus rho omega j, rho omega i works out to be. So that's theta i minus theta i star, theta j minus theta j star, plus theta j minus theta j star, theta i minus theta i star. So if you expand that out, you'll see that you get the following terms. Okay, so let's see. Um, this term matches with that term, and that just gives me zero. Then, uh, what's next? I guess this term, theta i, theta j star, 
with theta j star theta i. So we talked about earlier, I think on board number five of the second set of boards, the relations that these operators satisfy, and that's delta i j. So that's minus delta i j. And then if I look at this here, uh, that goes with that there. That's another minus delta i j. And finally, this plus this is again zero. So that gives me the desired minus two delta i j, which is what I needed to show. Similarly, you can check the other relations. It's for the exact same reasons using the commutation relations for theta i and theta i star. So um, the rest is up to you. So that's the check we need to see that this is in fact a Z2 graded module over CF. And then we can ask, well, what is the associated matrix factorization? And we'll get onto that in the next board. So what's the corresponding matrix factorization? For this quadratic form given by the difference of the sum of n squares. Well, it has underlying Z2 graded free module over the polynomial ring given by the exterior algebra. Notice that we're not using the algebra structure on this, right? So the operators of wedging and contracting with theta i and theta i star are what get used. So I say exterior algebra, but really what I mean is the underlying uh, graded module of the exterior algebra. So remember that to form a matrix factorization, uh, by which we mean a Z2 graded free module over the polynomial ring equipped with an odd endomorphism squaring to multiplication by F, the module is constructed by this tensor product, and the differential, delta, is given by the sum over I, I'll just write I, it means I equals 1 to N, of the variable times rho of the corresponding differential operator, which remember lives in the underlying vector space from which we construct the Clifford algebra. And similarly for the x's, the way I've defined these operators, um, that is rho of nu i, which is theta i plus theta i star, acting on the exterior algebra, and this is theta i minus theta i star. Rearranging that slightly, that's the sum over i, y i minus x i times theta i star, plus the sum over i, y i plus x i, theta i. Well, notice that uh, f is equal to the sum i equals 1 to n of y i minus x i y i plus x i because this thing is just the sum of n differences of squares. So this brings us back to the discussion in the first set of boards associated to this particular decomposition of f as a sum of products we have a matrix factorization and it's indeed this one that has been associated to the representation of the Clifford algebra in the previous board. Okay, so, well, that's a matrix factorization. Uh, why is it interesting? Well, I'll make two observations. The first is geometric. So the diagonal delta, by which I mean just the set of all points in 
k to the n cross k to the n, where f vanishes, reading the x variables first, say. So that's a closed subscheme of kn cross kn, and the associated coordinate ring is just uh, kx as a kxy module with xi and yi both acting as xi. And this, this part of the differential is a resolution of that module. So the causal complex which is the same underlying module. So maybe I'll just write it like this, underlined to mean all the thetas. The differential is just yi minus xi contraction with theta i star. That differential squares the zero, so that gives a complex. That's a free resolution. of the structure sheaf of the diagonal, meaning just, as I just defined, kx is a kxy module. Okay, so if we look at this polynomial f, um, say over c, over the complex numbers, we can see that it factors as a product of linear factors that look like yi minus an nth root of unity times xi which means that the zero set of that f has an irreducible decomposition as a union of n lines. And this just happens to be one of them, the diagonal. Corresponding to each one of those lines, there is a matrix factorization of f. So we see the correspondence between the geometry of the zero set of f and the category of matrix factorizations in this simple example. And this guy here, uh, this particular matrix factorization, is what's called the identity defect in the setting of uh, the mathematical physical perspective on matrix factorizations, which goes by the name of Landau Ginzburg models. So I'm going to leave it at that for this set of boards. So we've seen how to construct matrix factorizations from modules over the Clifford algebra that made use of the me methods of constructing operators on the exterior algebra. And um, we have a new way of thinking about this construction of matrix factorizations associated to expressions of the polynomial f as sums of products.